I did not forget about your question last week, Pat, and I realized why I was struggling trying to find what it was because the start of the flood is not the dates that I was looking for, but we're going to see the exact same thing happen at the, the com completion of the flood, which we will get into, and that will help us lead down that rabbit hole a little bit. Uh, at this point, we are in uh, we are in that pivot scene in Genesis, uh, in this I mean uh, the flood narrative, and that eight chapter eight verse one is that pet pivot scene. It's that one where we're going to see God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him. It's going to set this theme up that will be used over and over and over and over again all throughout Scripture of God remembering, God remembering, and much of that will help will help much of. God remembering, when you pay attention to the actions that cause God to remember, that's going to become really important as well. And we're going to discover that a little bit in Noah's story as well. And so what we see in Genesis chapter 8, the opening paragraph here, we're going to see that the waters are beginning to subside. So 8.1, but God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind blow over the earth and the waters subsided. I think we touched on this earlier. The wind blowing, and you got, if you recall the double meaning there? Yeah, the ruach, which is the spirit, is used elsewhere in the Bible for spirit of God, blew over, and also wind of God. I think that's working in both ways because we saw the spirit hovering over the waters in Genesis chapter 1. That's supposed to clue you off right there. Now we've got waters, we got water separating, and the spirit is involved. Here. And so you're thinking Genesis chapter 1, which you're, in your mind you're thinking recreation, right? And then you're going to see the fountains of the deep and the windows of the heavens were closed, and the rain from the heavens were restrained, and the waters receded from the earth continually. At the end of 150 days, the waters had abated. And at the and in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, the ark came to rest on the mountain of Ararat. And the waters continued to abate until the 10th month, the, in the 10th month, on the first day, uh, of the month, the tops of the mountains were then seen. So the waters have now come down, and the ark has come to rest where? <coughs> what Mount Ararat. Okay. And what mountain <coughs> is Mount Ararat? Any idea? So my first question is: Okay, where did the ark come to rest? This is not a trick question. Top of Mount Ararat. Top of Mount Ararat. Are you sure it's the top of Mount Ararat? No. The mountains of Ararat. Okay, so first clue, mountains of Ararat. Okay, well we've heard mount, mountains. Uh, if you do a quick Google search, what you begin to see is um, the mountains of Ararat are in kind of the northern, uh, northeastern side of Turkey, modern day Turkey. There is a mount, a the tallest mount within the mountains of Ararat, which is considered Mark Mount Ararat, but it's it's built by several different smaller peaks. So th there's sort of a region. The regions of the mount, these different mountains will kind of become considered Mount Ararat. Now, there are plenty of really cool documentaries out there where people have you know, gone and searched this. There's a lot of speculation about people who've seen it, seen remains of this ark. Somewhere on one of the slopes, you can see, like supposedly see like different rock formations that maybe have become have come about from petrified wood and there's some who have claimed to even when these ice caps on the top had melted at one point quite a bit somebody had apparently snuck into the, an area where they filmed you know wooden beams and structures that have been frozen in time for a long time it's all possible i i can't say whether that is true or not again until like there is just like a conclusive like hey here it is i would i would view those things with speculation but what I actually think is happening is less about, again, the mountain that it lands on and more about a wordplay that is going on. The wordplay is actually something that we've been seeing all throughout the Noah story. If you remember back when Noah is named, he is named Noah because why? Lamech, his dad, gives a reason for why they're going to name him Noah. Do you remember? It was a long time ago, I know. All those beautiful genealogies. Verse 28 of chapter 5. When Lamech had lived this many years, he is going to have a son, and he's going to name him Noah, because out of the ground uh, that the Lord God has cursed, one shall bring us relief. So they, he named him based off of this word relief. Now, when you look at the word relief, 
in the uh, Hebrew, what you see is Noah up here. I know it's hard to see. Noah up here is a word play off of Naham. Naham is that word relief, but in a different form of Noah. So Noah is going to be named similarly to relief. Now I have these pictures. Unfortunately, we do not have, they're not big enough. So I totally ruined that. So what you see is Noah here, and it's easier if you can actually see the Hebrew, so we're just going to have to deal with my awful Hebrew writing. We have Noah's name, okay, kind of like a hangman deal, and then we've got like a house sort of thing. This is all of Noah's name, Noah, right? It's N and C-H, because the O and A weren't added until much later. So Noah's name, which was given to him because he is going to bring relief or what you will also see as rest. Looks like an eighth note to me. <laughs> Similar. <laughs> what you see is this word right here, or this one letter right here, is one letter different than Noah, but it is the Naham, which is the same root word. Noah is the root word. In Hebrew, any of the root words that, that kind of build the, the actual words can tie together. So what we see is Noah, and we see Naham, which means rest or relief from the from the cursed ground now the cursed ground if you recall anybody happen to remember what the word curse is we would see it in genesis chapter 3 right the first thing that's cursed anybody remember that remember now nope the woman's not cursed yeah there you go so this is the word arar. Now, if you remember the arar, that is was also kind of a play on the word for arum and ran, which was the naked and crafty. So the snake is more arum than uh, any other beast of the field. Therefore, he ends up arar, like he ends up cursed more than the ground. The mountain. But the snake isn't the only thing that is cursed. What, is, what else is cursed? The Yes, the ground. Anybody remember what the land or the ground word is? Hint, it's based off of the, your teacher today. <laughs> yes, the Adama, right? Adam is a formation or version of the Adama because he came from the Adama. Adam, man, was from the Adama. So what this is, is the Hebrew Adama, which means land, ground, and so on. Okay, these are in play all throughout the, the narrative that you're going to see in the flood. When you get to chapter 8, what you're now going to see is where does the ark land? Or what, what, what happens with the ark? It ends up being what action, I should say. Okay, right. So if you look at that word rest, which is not going to low, but if anybody has it pulled up, you can. The word rest up here, you'll never guess, is a play off of Noah's name. And it, it, it looks like this. And it means nuach. It is a version of, this same, of these same words right here. So the ark comes to nuach on a mountain, right? And then what we see it is it, they're given a, a mountain. What, what mountain? Yeah. Ararat. The culture is burst. So what isn't very good in our translations is what the Bible Project, I've, I've heard them say it this way and I really like it. What's happening in the Hebrew here is it's almost like Noah, the ark become, starts to, or is now Noahed on Mount Kars. So it's like curse, but it rhymes with curse. It's kind of like a good equal equivalent in, in the English. So, the, so it's almost like the ark is landing on the Mount Curse, like Mount Curse. It's really not about Ararat. It's really not about which necessarily region. Now it can be. There's, again, there's nothing wrong with that, with a mountain in Turkey, but I'm okay with that. But really what you're seeing here is a bunch of plays. And then what Noah is going to do is he's going to relieve... Or what God's, well, we'll get there. I'll get there. We'll come back to this in a minute, okay? 
Any questions about this before we get to go on to the next thing? I'm not going to remember none. Don't worry about it. You don't have to. That's not a question. <laughs> what, what, I don't, what you don't need to uh, stress about is what I really want you to see is, is not so much about whether there's an arc up there. In fact, this was what one of the very big differences, though, however, <coughs> is found when you look at the ancient Mesopotamian flood narratives, which, if you recall, there was a bunch of flood narratives that we've seen all across the world. One of them is, is that with Gilgamesh, and this took place. This writing is written well before any of the earliest manuscripts we see with Genesis. And what you see is that the, these narratives land their arc in totally different places. Okay, keep that in mind for a minute because there's going to be a couple other very similar things that take place, and I think there's a, a reason for that as well. Okay, so we're up on the ark, or we're up on a, on a mountain. At the end of 40 days, Noah opened a window of the ark that he had made and sent forth a raven. It went to and fro from, uh, uh, until the waters were dried up from the earth. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. Then you guys know what happens next. What, what, what happens next? If you continue. You can just read it. Somebody read it. Finish reading it. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and brought her in the ark with him. He waited another seven days, and again he sent forth the dove out of the ark. But how far? Just until the end of that day. Right? And the dove came back to him in the evening, and behold, in her mouth was a freshly plucked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the waters had subsided from the earth. And he waited another seven days and sent forth the dove, and did not return to him anymore. Okay, how many birds does he send? How many types of birds? Okay, anybody happen to know what's, what's different between a raven and a dove in the mind of Moses in a later Levitical law? Very specific question, I understand. And I wouldn't expect you to know. Afraid, that is a... Yes, which would make it a clean animal or an unclean animal? Unclean. Absolutely. So a raven gets sent out and it goes away. It doesn't come back. Right? Then he's going to take a dove. And a dove, which we, we read in later <coughs> narratives, obviously, is considered a clean animal. It can be used for sacrifice. There's multiple things that we could go into here, but. What I really want you to see is, one, there's parallels to that ancient Mesopotamian Gilgamesh story. Gilgamesh is going to do the same thing. He's going to send out a raven. And it, there's going to be, if you go and look up the Gilgamesh epic and look up the flood and the, and the raven and dove and stuff like that, you'll see similar things that are happening as far as, as far as that goes. But what's happening is he's going to send this dove out. He's going to send these birds out, and he's going to do it three different times. Now, anytime you begin to, to read something that's happening three, on three separate occasions in a, in a short recession here, it generally means that it's a testing narrative, right? It generally means that there, these things are going to be a test. So, like, for instance, when you go with Abraham, and Abraham is going to travel three days journey to Mount Moriah, when you look at Jonah, who's going to go three days walk into, into Nineveh, these are all different testing narratives to kind of discover whether or not the righteous and blameless one will will pass that test we've seen this already the righteous and blameless one he's been given a test what was that test pre-flood noah yeah to build the ark right then he's going to complete that test so he passes it good job he gets on the ark does everything the way god says it now who's being tested here the dove <laughs> the dove's being used as a test but who's being tested? Wouldn't it be Noah, Noah again? Noah's doing the sending, right? Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. So Noah is testing God's promise. Oh, yeah. Duh. Noah is testing the promise that God would would use him <coughs> and his seed and and you know start fresh, refill the earth, sort of thing. And so what he's doing is he's sitting out on top of a mountain. He's sitting out these birds. These birds are going to, he's waiting for proof that, hey, the flood is going to subside, that we can get off this boat and we can start again. Again, there's more we can get into that, but I, I think for lack of time, we should move on. Any questions about those things? That's the main thing I want you to see is Noah's testing and God, God proves his test. Sends back an olive branch and then the dove goes, goes off and stays, stays away. Now, Again, this is one of those moments where 
if you're catching the hints that the author's giving you, we've already seen wind blowing over water, we see land appear, and now we see a dove. And what you're hearing is all these narratives, both at Jesus' baptism and in Genesis 1, the Spirit descends like a dove in Jesus' baptism, the Spirit is hovering over the waters in Genesis chapter 1. Both of these things represent through the waters and representation of new life, right? So Noah is, is, being, is on the receiving end of, of what God promised him. It is a new creation, new life, we're starting over, Right? And so God is fulfilling his side of, of, of the promise to Noah. And why, yeah. Why the raven? So a lot of that, I think, is polemical. So it's, it's, it's against the writings of the time, popular writings of the time. It'd be like if I rewrote Harry Potter and made him the actual Lord of Voldemort for any Harry Potter weird nerds out here. If you know Harry Potter, he's the hero of the story. If I wrote him as the, the bad guy. And so the raven, which is what Gilgamesh will use to prove that he's, he's succeeded in averting the floods, he sends out a raven, and that raven becomes the proof for him. Well, the raven here in Noah's story is useless. It does nothing. It's just, we could have done without that altogether. <coughs> There's probably more to that. My brain can't recall it at the moment, but... He, he only brought the animals in, in two in pairs, so he only had two dogs, maybe, and he made them use one well, uh, the dove, the dove are the clean animals, oh, and so he actually has, yeah. So he has multiple of those. Of course, the question remains: How does he even know? Well, actually, that is an important question. How does Noah know that the dove is a clean animal? Which actually we don't discover yet. We know that we'll discover that here in his actions in just a moment. <coughs> okay, so ignore that question for a minute. We'll come back to it. Okay, let's get to Pat's intuitive questions from last week. Verse 13, in the 600 and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried from all the earth, and Noah removed the covering from the ark, looked, and behold, the face of the Adama was dry. Okay, we get this very, very specific time frame again. Somebody turn to, well, let me get back to my notes here. Exodus chapter 12, verse Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Somebody, whoever's pulling that up, just who's willing to read it in a second. Keep this in mind. I'm going to give you a couple more. Somebody willing to look at that? You said one and two? Yeah, okay. You got, uh, Isis got Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Don't read it yet. I need Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Okay. Got it. Okay, Kayla, go ahead. Take it. And I need Exodus chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. Oh, Reagan raised his hand. <laughs> I'm ignoring you, Joe. Yeah. I'm trying to pull those uh, backseat Baptists in. I'll tell you a trick next, for next week. Okay, good to know. Exodus, uh, you lost it now. Exodus chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. <laughs> Should have been in the background. Okay, Genesis chapter 8, verse 13. What we see is it came about in the 601st year. And the word is in the beginning of the first month. In the beginning is Reshit. It is the same exact word that we're going to find in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. So maybe whoever had that, read that out loud. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and in deep darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Okay, so we have multiple connections to this very moment. And what we see is at the very beginning of what? Yeah, the creation. We see God is going to move. He's going to... Uh, usher in the new creation. Then we get Genesis chapter 8. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the beginning, on the first month, the water was dried up from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and he's able to get off. What we're going to see is we're adding a little tiny side of the puzzle now. So we've, we've been given like the main piece, now we're given an arm of the piece. And what happens is as you begin to put these things together, they're given little slightly different pieces, and it's going to start to show the bigger picture of everything that's happening. This will make sense in a second. Exodus chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you at the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Right. So the date of the Passover, which is what Moses is talking about right now, is going to happen <coughs> this month. In this month, the Reshit, the beginning of the months for you, it is to be the first month of the year. So now what we have is the first uh, installment of the Passover, which is based off of the Exodus narrative. The first installment of that is going to be in the beginning on the first month of the first year, of this year. And so what we're seeing, if we put that piece 
with the Noah piece and with the Genesis chapter 1 piece, what we're seeing is we're seeing a clear picture that this is the start of something new, like the start of a new beginning. Okay, keep that in mind. Let's go to Exodus chapter 40, verse 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Perfect. This is the date of the, and the completion and the inauguration of the tabernacle. So this all takes place on the first day of the beginning, the Rashid month, that you shall set this tabernacle up in the tent in the new meeting. So what you're seeing are all these little puzzle pieces, right? They're all, they kind of stand on their own. But as you begin to put them together, they're all standing for something different. And I'm going to read a quote by a, by a, a, a um, scholar named Joseph Blankenship, Blankensop. He says this, according to the chronology, the new world emerged from the floodwaters on the first day of the liturgical year, the same day on which the tabernacle was set up and dedicated in the wilderness. It will be recalled that the first temple was also dedicated during Sukkot, the auto, uh, autumnal, I can't say that word, autumnal, there you go, new year festival, that's found in 1 Kings chapter 8. We are also told it, that it took seven years to build, which is related to the seven days of creation. The same dating system requires that the week of creation, Genesis 1, be the first week of the liturgical year, or in other words, that primordial New Year festival. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a celebration of Genesis 1 in all of creation, God doing a new thing, God starting a new creation, God continuing to, we, we as humans, continuing to recognize in a physical realm, the tabernacle, and in the Passover, so in memory and looking back, in celebration of God's promise to for a new start. Okay, now this is a lot of mumbo jumbo. What I'm trying to say is that the, the author here is trying to, as you meditate on the scripture, you're starting to see this theme that God is making these promises and he's fulfilling these promises for a new start, a new creation, a new beginning, and they all tie together and work together. And it is believed, some scholars believe, it's all opinion, but there's very good reason to believe that Jesus' birth probably actually took place in relation to this particular date. And so it was probably more of a September, October 1st, one of those lunar calendar birth uh, dates, as opposed to when we celebrate, obviously, in in the April frame. That doesn't matter, that's just speculation, but I think it, it would be very fitting for that to kind of take place, okay? Yes? Are you done with that section? <laughs> I got a question there. in that section, but it's... Okay, pause for that just um, a second. Probably all top. We'll make sure. The first day of the first month, Mm -hmm. Is it based on the lunar year? Is it the new moon or the full moon? Or yes. how did they get, where uh, does it, how does it start? <coughs> Moses is going to write more on that in later uh, in the Torah. So look it up and let me know. <laughs> but yes, it's based off of the signs. It's based off of Genesis 1, the lunar calendar. There are all the stars and the moons and the suns are there for times and seasons. It's for festivals. All the festivals are, are an opportunity for Israel to hit their reset on their calendar, ultimately, to every such and such lunar cycle and whatnot. Recall and remember, hit that reset button in their own culture. Recall and remember what, what God has been doing since the beginning of all time throughout all of the nation of Israel's setting. So it's kind of like our Christmas and Easter, our Priester, you know, moments where they're sort of reset buttons for anybody who's kind of wandered away for a while. Well, they did this once a quarter, ultimately, and it, but it's all based off of the signs and the seasons of the stars and the sun, the moon, and the stars. So were there months the same 30 days, or is it... Go, okay. Let me know what you find out. <laughs> uh, there are multiple attestations as what the actual Hebrew calendar was supposed to look like. It's disagreed upon right now, uh, if, I, if I recall. But I, I just, I don't know. Okay. I barely know what date it is today, <laughs> let alone in their uh, ancient calendar. What? But this is very specific. It is very specific to uh, <coughs> when and why, and they're going to tie these later narratives to these events, same events. And you're going to see the same repeating phrases to help tie all that stuff together into the meaning and the message that's being portrayed to those who are hearing it. So our 12 months aren't necessarily based <coughs> on biblical. Or Jewish. It, it just works different. 
They have different, I mean, all of ours are, were based off of a Roman calendar that was developed, but even that was based off of astrological type situations and named after Roman emperors and, you know, Augustus is August and, all, you know, that kind of thing. And so, which of course, if, if you are a seed of the serpent, a power of darkness who really wants to mess up a nation of people who hit the reset button, you know, four times a year on these different festivals, of course, you know, inserting a new calendar to mix things up, <laughs> you know, is going to help or hurt that in, in ways. But I have no, I'm not, I do not ever claim to be anything to do with the Jewish calendar. So yeah, so let me know what you guys find. <laughs> okay, your so question. Verse 13, it says that uh, Noah removed the covering <laughs> of the ark. Great. Yeah. So are we talking about Opening the door, or are we talking about the, the window, implication taking here? The roof off, the or implication is he taking here. everything off of it and <laughs> uh, letting everything go free right there, like just completely down to the skeleton. This is the first mention of the covering. Yeah. Oh, we are yeah. not told anything about the covering. Well, I thought when they hid behind fig leaves, that was a... you're right. But this is what's, in the ark narrative. She said when they hid behind fig leaves. So in the ark narrative. What you see is you don't mint, it's not mentioned a covering. What you're seeing is he's supposed to put the you know vitamin and pitch and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't talk about a covering. So this is the first mention of a covering. Again, for the astute readers like you guys are, and this is why we read it aloud in community because all these frames work together. Great. What you see is again a further message being portrayed about what God did in Eden which was the fig leaves that were going to be no good for covering their shame and stuff would be the shedding of the blood of an animal to provide coverings for their shame and their guilt. The Ark is now a, a mini representation of the Eden. We've got the same exact settings. So you're reading this with this in mind of the settings of Eden with the covering and the bloodshed of, of an animal. And now with that lens in mind, you, you keep reading and you start to see how the author's connecting those Eden story, Edenic story, the Edenic, Edenic story and the Noic story. And so you hit cover. It's the first time we've heard that. It stands out because we just read apparently, you know, a little bit ago about the building of the ark. It didn't mention a covering. So now he removes the covering and you've got that in mind. That sounds familiar. It sounds like covering that we've heard about a couple chapter, chapters ago in Eden. Keep that in mind when we move into the next. What does it mean with next the section. face of the ground? It's a pop. It's just a popular. So, for instance, when Cain murders Abel, right, the blood cries out from the rocks. Oh, okay. Like it's a personification of like the the you know the ground itself. So the crying up will come up to God. Keep that in mind too, because all of these things are going to all start to tie together with all these previous narratives. So the face of the ground is is a pop. It's going to talk about that a lot in, in many narratives. The face of the ground. Does the tabernacle have a covering? Yes. Yeah, the tabernacle has got a big co has a big covering over the top. Yep. So there's a temple. It also is, the temple will have a three tiered structure with the window in the top. There's there's going to be multiple versions of all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But evidently he had to remove the covering to see. <coughs> yep. Only but then he'd already let the huh? Only God could have put that in place. It makes you wonder if it's something that happened. We don't know. But yeah. hearing the blood as a protection. Of yeah, and, and I think that you can come to that conclusion when you, as you tie together those previous narratives, the, the shed it blood. It doesn't matter, but it's interesting. I think so. <laughs> I, think, I think these are great ways that, that this literature, as you read it over and over and over again, and you just hear new things, and you're like, whoa, wait, what? Yeah, and then I swear you're just, I've never heard Yeah. I'm yeah. And then what cut, where did he open the side to send the birds out? The window. The, oh, the window, yeah. So it, it, I think parallel things are also happening. If you recall, in Psalm, it talks about that God is the one who stretches out the covering of the, of the sky. This is that firmament, like in the snow globe. This is that thing that holds all the windows of the heavens and the waters open. And if you remember at the beginning of the flood, what you see, the windows are open, the, the, the waters of the great abyss come forward. Now what you're seeing is a, a microcosmic picture of that. Man can open now the window because the windows of the heavens have been closed and the covering has been, can be removed. It, it, there's, I think that these are all little things that like, you could just spend forever reading and just discover so much, right? And then we get stuck on like two by two animals came on a boat, you know, like. You 
windows of heaven were stopped, verse two, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Is that the same thing? Is it two different things? Uh, I think the ancient Israelite had a, a different view of what we see. We assumed it was just rain. I think what's happened is the firmament was opened and the waters that were above the earth alongside the rain came crashing down in on a creation. Basically what happened is God has um, been holding back the chaos waters of decreation. He's Every day he is holding those waters back. And at that moment, he gave them over to destruction. He quit holding up that tent. And now all the waters came crashing down, but now he's reestablished that tent. They've stopped. The waters of the great deep have opened back up and drained back down. He's on a high place in the midst of, of animals and we're the blameless and righteous one. And God has reestablished his hold on creation. And then what we're going to discover about who God is and why that's important here in a minute will come out. Wait, okay, in the end times, does it flood again? Not not like that, because okay. of what we're going to read. And so other things will be described in a similar fashion, because that's the language that will be used throughout the Bible. Like when you get to Sodom and Gomorrah, it doesn't flood anymore. It rains down fire and brimstone. And so they're just little hints that you're supposed to tie these narratives together, but it's not the same thing. And it's not worldwide at that point. So it's a good question. Anything else? Okay, <laughs> so next we're going to see it all dried up, face of the ground, in the second month, uh, all that time. Verse 16, we are going to see this same liturgical procession that we saw previous of them getting on the ark. We see this command, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring with you every living thing that was with you of all flesh, birds and animals, every creepy thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. And ten. The first command. Keep thinking back. Yep. The, all these authors are tying back to that. Be fruitful, multiply. And so the command is given. Noah goes out with his sons and his wife and his wife's sons. Every beast, every creeping thing, every bird that moves in the earth. And what you see is this is a, a reversal of what we saw in Genesis 1. He creates the birds in the sky. He creates the creepers on the ground. He creates the beasts in the field. Then he creates man. Now we see the man walk out, the beasts in the field, the birds in the sky. You're watching like a in verse of what we read in Genesis chapter 1 and then they add went out by families from the ark this is the first mention of families in all the Bible I wonder if that is going to become very important in all the coming narratives you think families are going to become important okay and let's we'll land the plane here with the, the final verses so where is Noah at this point out of the ark. Is he is stepping foot out of the ark and where is he? Uh, on Mount Kars, right? On Mount Ararat, right? <coughs> so he is on a high place. He is stepping out of the ark. And the first thing he's gonna do is he's gonna build an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird. Pop quiz. Who in the Bible has the ability to determine if something is clean or not on an altar. A priest. Yeah, so a priest. So Noah is being portrayed in a priestly manner. This is not the first time we've seen that, because if you think back to the Adam and Eve narrative, if you hold the view that Genesis 1 was the creation of all humanity, Adama, Adam, I mean Adam, humanity, and Genesis chapter 2 now talks about the creation of Ha-Adam, which is the man and the woman, what you see are two people, individuals, who are able to walk in the presence with God himself in the center of this forbidden place that other people apparently have no access to. And when they're expelled from that, they, they are given language to work. It'll be the same language that is used in the tabernacle. The priests start to work in the tabernacle the same way that Adam is to work the grounds in the garden. So there's a lot of little pieces there, but what we see is Adam and Eve are, are, are these pictures of the first priest, priestly people. Noah is going to, in the new creation, be a picture of the first priestly type. And he builds an altar. He pulls together clean animals, which, again, the question is, how does he know what's clean, what's not? I mean, there's so many little questions there that we're not given. But what we see is he offered a burnt offering on the altar. Now, a burnt offering is a little bit 
it kind of falls short of what this actual word is. So if you go to Step Bible and you and, and if this works, I'll show you Genesis chapter eight at the end of it. It is called the Ola offering. It's the same offering that is described in, in Leviticus chapter 1. And the reason why this is a different offering than any burnt offering is most offerings are burnt offerings. What this particular, oh, yes. So what this, you know, built an offering, took some of everything, and he offered burnt offerings. Now, if you look at this word right here, I'm, I don't know if you can see that, but I can zoom in. It is the Ola offering. Here's another Hebrew word, O-L-A-H. And it is based off of the, the root of the same, because remember, it's just oh. LH, LH. Oh. Allah means to come up. So what this offering is, is a, a, a going up offering. In other words, the burnt offerings, uh, oftentimes what would happen is people would come together, they would offer their, uh, their animal uh, to the priest. The priest would then uh, kind of dissect the animal. Uh, it would take the head, the legs, the um, excrements, and it would, burn, uh, it would burn those things. And then it would take the good cuts of meat, and he would cut off all the fat. And all the fat is burned and goes to the Lord. And then the good pieces that aren't the fat are then uh, separated up between the priests. They take a portion, and the rest goes to the people who offered the animal. And they go and they party, and they, they eat it up with friends and family, and they celebrate this um, offering that this burnt offering that is used to, to cover multiple things. What the Ola offering is, is you take the entire animal and you offer the whole thing. It all burns. There's nothing that man walks away with and enjoys out of that. It's just a total sacrifice of a complete burnt offering. This is the same picture that we see with the Cain and Abel story, the offering of the, the, the first of his flock, the first one of the flock. So he comes out and he offers up the greatest sacrifice he possibly can, and God's response is that it was a pleasing aroma that will come up. He smells a pleasing aroma as it comes up before the Lord. This pleasing aroma is continuing this same exact pattern here because what we see is the pleasing aroma oh, yeah. okay is actually Noah's name as as an adjective it is the riach it's the riach it, it is to smell a pleasing aroma a, a, a riach will come up before the Lord and what he's going to do is he's going to undo the curse that was given to the ground so he's going to undo the arar and actually this is a different word then Arar, if you continue on. How about the Vison? Pleasing aroma. He said, I will never curse. This is the word Kalal, which is, yes, so dishonor. So in, in the Hebrew Bible, there's two words for curse. One is Arar. This is actual curse. This is what happens to the land. This is what happens to the serpent. He is cursed. Right? He, is, he is made low. It is not a good thing. What we see here is the kalal, which is to act as if it were cursed. And so what's happening is God is saying here, never again will I act as if it is cursed, the ground that is, because of man. And then we'll go into that next section. So what's happening is the same thing that's happened in Genesis chapter 16, verse 5. If, you, if, if one of you will turn there real quick, Genesis 16, 5. Read that. This is when hey, this is with Abraham and Hagar. <coughs> and Sarah I said unto Abram, My wrong is that is that right? May the wrong. Is that the right verse? Yeah. Yeah, sixteen five, yep. My wrong be upon thee, I have given my maid to thy bosom, and when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between me and thee. So the way that, that, that Sarah is, is going to treat Hagar now is in this kalal. It is as a cursed one. She's going to treat her as a cursed one. We see the same thing in Leviticus 19.14. Somebody go there real quick. Leviticus 19.14. A dead man, nor place a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall revere your God. I am the Lord. 
Yep. So again, same thing. You shall not act as if this dead man is cursed. You shall not act as, as if he is going to be that one. In 2 Samuel 16, verse 3, I'll just read that. And the king said, And where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he remains in Jerusalem. Am I reading the right one? 2 Samuel 16, 13. No, I'm not. 13. So David and his men went on the road while Shimei went alongside the hillside opposite of him and cursed as he went and thrown stones at him and flung dust. And the king and all the people who were with him arrived weary of the Jordan and refreshed himself. This is what this word is. If you continue to go down that list of, of all the times that kalal is used is, is when you act as if something is arar, is cursed. It is not itself cursed, but it's acting as if. So you want to stay away from it. You're going to act like it's dishonorable. You don't want it. It'll make you unclean if you're around it. And so what's happening now is that in that context, God does not use arar. And side note, who is God talking to at this moment? No one. He's talking to himself. That's important to see. So Noah is up on top of the mountain. He offers a burnt olah, a coming up offering. It provides a, a pleasing aroma for God. God's interaction with himself now, in his own heart, he's going to say those words. I will never again act as if the ground is cursed because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold, heat, summer, winter, day, night, shall not Shabbat, which is the word Sabbath, but my translation says cease. <coughs> so why is God going to not curse the ground anymore? He's undoing what? Because he doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> what is the reason behind, what is the, the, the driving factor for why God is not going to curse the ground anymore? Because his aroma was pleasing. Okay, keep that in mind, but he says specifically about something to do with man's heart. The intent of man's heart is evil. Yes. So God now looks and sees the priest who's offering a burnt aroma on a high place, and it's a pleasing aroma. He's going to say in his own heart, I will never do this again, because now I know every intention of man's heart is evil continuously. That sounds familiar. We've talked about it before, because that's what started this whole thing. Genesis chapter 6, the wickedness. Verse 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness was great, in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was evil continually, and the Lord regretted saying this, regretted this, and it grieved him in his heart. So we see man's heart, it's wickedness, it's evil continuously, and it's grieving. He is nahaming, he is needing comfort for the wickedness that he sees in the heart of man, and it's in his heart. Now we see the two hearts again, and God's heart is now, he's now saying in his heart that he's never going to do this again. And what's the outcome of man's heart? Sorry. It's still in the same place. So Noah, the blameless and righteous one, has accomplished what? Nothing. He's accomplished something. Other than the show. Okay. What was the action that we just saw him do? He sacrificed. Yep. He stood up on a high place. And he offered an intercessory, pleasing aroma so that will go up before God, and God will naham from ever destroying that again. Why? Man's heart was never the thing that was going to change in this whole, the whole deal. If you look at it, Genesis chapter 6, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intention, so and that every intention of man's heart is evil continuously. We believe the flood came because every intention of man's heart was continuously. No, what, why the flood came is because man was great on the earth and that the wickedness of that man was great on the earth. In other words, the people are all killing each other. They have a heart issue. It's causing them to kill. The, the wickedness is spread everywhere. So now he's going to give them over to utter destruction, which they're already doing. And it's, it's not going to fix the heart problem, but it's going to start fresh the, the cursed land problem. And the cursed land problem only came because someone stood up and offered an intercessory offering, a going up offering that pleased uh, God. And then he will say in his heart, he'll make that covenant that he'll never flood the earth again because every intention of man's heart is evil continuously. The problem is still there. The problem is not fixed. He's just cleansed the land. He's uncursed the ground at this point, right? 
And so now we live in an uncursed ground with a God who is, who is making a covenant with Noah. Noah doesn't even know it, I mean, ultimately. And, excuse me. And, uh, I'm going to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Any so questions we, about that? So we, know the, we know the future stories of the Bible. We know that Jesus is the one, only one that's going to be able to change the heart of man. Yes. Yes, exactly. The problem is not, or the problem is that man needs a new heart. The way Paul will say it is, it is no longer I, but Christ who, who lives in me. Yeah, the way Jesus himself will say it in Mark when he's talking to, to the chief priests and the scribes and stuff who are sitting here going, like, your disciples never washed your hands. He's going to say, yeah, it's not the hands that make you unclean. It's the heart. We talked about this in our, in our Sunday school this morning. It's the heart. It's what comes out of man, right? Because when you eat, it just goes to the stomach. It doesn't change the heart. The heart is the issue. Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapter 9. That was, n that was not what the flood was fixing but what the flood was doing was showing us one more mosaic picture of one who will stand up on a high place and intercede for, for the lives of many, and that God will naham, or hold back a destruction that they deserve. Um, if you go to, if you think about Moses' story, when he's up on, on Mount Sinai, and the children of Israel at the bottom of the mountain, and they're building themselves an idol with a bunch of gold they melted together. And God is so angry, he says to Noah, or he says to Moses, that he is going to destroy them and start over with Moses. And Moses gives the phrase, remember, well, he gives many phrases. He says, hey, those Egyptians that you just let out, they're going to think you're crazy. If you just go and kill these people that you just let out, you just perform this incredible thing, the Egyptians are going to think you're crazy. Also, remember how you said you were going to bless the, those through these people. So what, what Moses does is he stands as an intercessor and even says to the, to, to the Israelites later, he says, I'm going to go up here. Who knows? Maybe God will, will, it will change his mind or may, he'll take me instead. So Moses will be another picture of that intercessor who stands up on Mount Sinai and re brings to mind God's own covenant. So he changes God, God's intentions by reminding him to stay the same, ultimately. Which goes into a whole other rabbit hole of what does it mean to change God's heart and all that kind of stuff. We won't go down that. We've been there a couple times and it's, it's, inter it's very intricate. What we're seeing, though, is the same. Moses will stand here. He builds an altar. It's pleasing aroma. God will say in his heart, I won't do this any again. There's still a heart problem, right? And so, which is the setting of the very next thing that we'll read next week. Three weeks. <laughs> Three weeks. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Uh, it, oh, eight one goes along with the Moses chapter eight verse one, and God remembered Noah and all the animals. Moses' reminder to God: Remember the covenant that you made, that you would bless the people, bless all the earth through these people. You cannot destroy them. Moses will add the extra intercessory thing because while Noah never actually communed with God at that point, Noah, or while Noah never communed with God, Moses is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and will ultimately get to see the glory of him in his backside through a cleft in the rock. And so you're seeing little tiny puzzle pieces that keep getting like added little extras that one that get put together. They all add up to exactly who Jesus is. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're going to let Scott come back. And then, and then not have Bible study for two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't see a way around it because they, they've got Operation Christmas Child. So, and then we have a, a thing. So, any questions as we close? It's a it's a little dry. I I know. What I what I want you to see though is is the same thing I kind of been talking about. One, it's all so intentional. Like this, there's, I mean, I don't even think man could have truly come up with this all, how it's all so interconnected. But two, that's some, some of the things that, that, that we make matter just don't. Where the mountain was, it, it doesn't matter. Like, oh, uh, uh, I'll, I'll end with this, because I just remember. The reason why seeing the polemical nature, which is the writing that happens in scripture that is very similar to all writing, these writing, ancient writings and stories and myths that were written before this, really helps those in ancient, in ancient Israel and ancient Mesopotamia understand who God, Yahweh, is. 
And this being said, is the sacrifice that Moses did is actually, or Noah did, is actually just a motif for an ancient hero's post-flood antediluvian action. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, this is in Tablet 11, we see this writing. Gilgamesh says, I set up an offering stand on the top of the mountain. Seven and seven cult vessels I set out. I heaped reeds, cedar, myrtle, and their bowels. The gods smelled the savor. The gods smelled the sweet savor. The gods crowded around the sacrifices like flies. And going on, what we see is the function of this is a little bit different. And I'm just going to read it, so just stick with me. The gods crowded around the sacrifices like flies. As soon as Balet Eli arrived, she held up a great fly ornament that Anu had made in her made her in his infatuation. These are all ancient Mesopotamian gods. Oh, these gods here, as surely as I shall not forget the lapis on my neck, I shall be mindful of these days and not forget forever. Let the gods come to the offering, but Enlil must not come to the offering, for he, unreasoning, brought on the flood. Enlil is the one who brings the flood in, in this story. Reckoning my people for destruction. Suddenly, as Enlil arrived, he saw the bow. Enlil became angry. He was filled with the fury of the gods. Who came out alive? No man uh, was to survive this destruction. Nin Ninurta, which is the Noahic version of in the ancient Mesopotamia, made ready to speak, and he said to the wor warrior Enlil, But who but Ea could devise such a thing? For Ea alone knows every craft. Ea made ready to speak and said to the warrior Enlil, You, a warrior, the sage of the gods, how could you unreasoning? have brought on the deluge, impose punishment for the sinner, for his sins, on the transgressions of his transgressions. And let me read this. The goddess Belaliti Bella comes with her fancy fly jewel necklace, uh, it, and it is a reminder to the gods that the flood should never, ever happen again. In her speech, she wants the gods to learn a lesson from the flood, that indiscriminate slaughter of humanity is not in their own best interest, because what is not told in this story is the gods began to starve because they didn't have a bunch of slave humans to find them food. The final line shows the God's new policy. Each sinner will face the consequences for their own actions as opposed to a, the great actions of men. And so what you see is in the polemical nature of this, of this flood narrative, Yahweh looks totally different. Because the problem, he handed them over to their own destruction but had a fix, and the problem still remained the same, and it wasn't out of his own selfish ways of, of survival and, and existence, but it was out of love and, and care for the blameless and righteous one and those who are connected with him, even though the outcome is still going to remain the same. You can see how that writing is just polar opposite of, of, of this is a snippet of many flood narratives that, that all kind of talk totally different. And that's why Yahweh is, is so much greater and grander. Okay? That was a lot. I did it. <laughs> let, me, let me pray. Father God, thank you for the study tonight. I pray that you will be with us as we ponder on these things, as we meditate on them. <coughs> God, I pray that you will just uh, continue to reveal to us just how grand and how incredible and epic and life-changing all of this is and how you are constantly showing us from the start how, how you, will, you, you planned and are continuing to fix those things. God, we're thankful for the time we had together. Opening the word, bring us back here safely next time. We love you in your name. Amen.